Music, good music. All right. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Renewing your vision. That is the Great Commission. The first word was go. Go. That means don't stay. Whatever needs to be done will not be able to be done here. When there's a commission, when God commissions you to do something, that means you have to go to complete and do the work that he's called you to do. Go. And he's calling every one of us to go someplace. So what are we going to do now today? We want to renew our vision. And every once in a while, we have to stop and look back and say how far we've come. You look at where you've come and look at where you've grown, gone from, and something should let you see that you're growing. So this is a checkpoint now. Are you growing this year? Are you able to attain more this year? As we're going through the mid-year point, have you grown in Christ? Have you completed the work or doing the work that he's called you to do this year? Renewing your vision. Everyone is given 24 hours per day. 24 hours. The rich are given no more time than the poor. The have and have nots, the winners and losers are given the same measure. So how is it that some people are able to do so much more in that same block of time? It's priorities. They're able to set their goals, prioritize them, and continue to renew their vision. What got you into this in the first place? What brought you together? What is the vow that you took that you have to renew once in a while to ensure that you're still on track and doing what you know you should do? Renewing your vision. Priorities. I looked at where we spend our time. You'll be amazed at where we spend our spare time because that will determine your priorities. If I ask you what your priorities are, you say, well, it's God, family, church, work, and all that sounds good, but where our priorities really are is where we're spending our time. You want to know what your priorities are? We're going to talk about that in a moment. Prioritizing, looking at your time. In an average 70-year lifespan, we spend 23 years of a 70-year lifespan sleeping. That's a third of our life almost we spend asleep. Some of you are getting drowsy right now. Wake up. <laughs> 16 years working, eight years watching TV, six years eating, four years with illness, two years getting dressed. That's just this morning. <laughs> but our relationship with Jesus Christ, with religion and developing our faith, in a seven year lifespan, we spend six months. But if you ask you what's your priorities, God is number one. But what we're really spending our time determines our priorities. I was shocked when I read, looked at my priority list and saw where I was spending my time. Because if you asked me where my priorities were, I would probably answer you what you would want to hear. But here's where I spend my time. Here's my priorities based upon my time schedule. I spend 45 minutes a day working out. I spend 25 to 30 minutes with my prayer life, my devotion, reading the scripture. Now, I'm not talking about sermon preparation and Bible studies because that goes to my vocation. That's for to work as a pastor. But I'm talking about my personal time with God, my personal time, 25 to 30 minutes per day. Kim, who I love, I spend about five minutes a day with Kim. Sad. If you say, is it Kim your priority? Of course she's my priority. Five minutes a day. But here's where I, spend a, I found a lot of my time. I spend over an hour a day. Now, don't judge me on this. And I spent almost an hour of day looking at mindless YouTube videos and Facebook and I'm looking at chatting with friends and doing stuff like that. Almost an hour a day. Now, if you ask me, what's my priority? You mean that's been, that takes priority over my health, over my relationship with Jesus, over my relationship with my wife? So I ask you, where are your priorities? Renew your vision. What did, you, what did you determine is going to be your priorities this year? Where is your vision set this year? And look at how you're spending your time. And once you set your priorities again and you, you, you renew your vision, keep the main thing the main thing. 
If God is number one in your life, then you should be spending more time and more focus and more energy in building that relationship than anything else. Everything else comes down on the down line. If your family is your priority, you should be spending more time with your family. If your health is a priority, how much time do you really spend with your health? We don't cook anymore, do we? we I, I, if we can't do it in one minute, we can't prepare a meal in one minute, we don't eat it. We'll drive through, and our priority is our health, but we're not spending the time and focusing on the things that really does matter, our health. When you have a moment, look at how you're spending your personal time. Not your work time, you have to work, everybody has to work, but your own personal time will determine what your priorities are. So with the church, if someone asks you what is the purpose and why does the church exist? A survey was taken and 83% of church members said that the church exists for, to take care of their families, themselves, and other members. This is like 89% said, that's where the church exists, to take care of me, my family, and other members of the church. And 11% said that the church exists to fulfill the Great Commission, to save the lost, and bring the world to Jesus Christ, to come to know Jesus Christ as a personal savior. 11% said that. But most of them could not name three of the Gospels. They did not know more than two of the disciples. They didn't read the Bible daily. They didn't pray every day. They didn't know much about the Great Commission and why Jesus came. They believed that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. That's what some people do. They don't know the difference. They, they think that they're really a devoted believer, but deep down they don't really devote their time to learning and growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the Great Commission. What Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. He did not say go and build churches. He did not tell us to do that. He did not say go and grow denominations. He did not say go and have church. He says go and make disciples. There's a difference, isn't there? When our mission and our goal is to build a kingdom and not build membership. And we're, we're intent on seeing Christ be lifted up. Yes. Not lifting up your name and you know, the pastor's name and say, I'm AME, I'm CME, and I'm you and me. And whatever we're claiming as our denomination. We're not proud about anything except being called the child of the living God. Because when Jesus comes, he will not bring any denomination with him. Okay, Baptists, come on up. Ba no, wait, hold up, Methodists, hold up. Pentecostals, now come on. You no, he's going to come for the church. And the church is the body of believers. When the church comes, we all are going to go. Every believer, everyone who's really, really believes in Jesus Christ, everyone who's completed their work and their assignment, who's doing what they know they're to do, we're going to be lifted up. And you know it could be today. You know, I hope it's today. Wow, imagine it today if in the twinkling of an eye the trumpet sounds and, and the dead in Christ shall rise and then those who are with us shall be lifted up. Yeah. What a great getting up morning. Yeah. See, if, if you're not excited about that, that means you're not rapture ready. Uh -oh. Because it could happen. The Bible says that, that, that there's going to be two in the field and one will be taken and the other will be left. And two will be in the bed and one taken and the other left. So if I were you, I'd spend my time with some unbelievers. So that when one is taken, you say, I told you, you should have listened to me. <laughs> and by all accounts, it could happen soon. We don't have another day to waste. If there's something that we can do, if there's good that we must do, let's do it now. If we can help somebody, if we can share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody, let's do it now. Because we will not get a chance to pass this way again. Every day you meet people that you may never meet again in your life. But God has brought them into your path for a purpose. There's a reason why somebody come into your life. Let's not waste our time wasting time. Time is one of those things that you can never get back. It's static. Time is static. You can always make more money, but you can never make more time. You can always look back and say, I, 
I, I did well, I, I made a good living, but you can't say I made one point of time. Time is a gift that's given to us. And we're meant to make the good use of the time, the short time that we're given in this earth. In the old, in the beginning churches, here's some things that did not happen in churches that we do today in churches. When you think about when Jesus was here, they did not have weddings in churches. They were in houses and they were in different assemblies, but they did not have weddings. They did not have funerals at churches. They did not have baptisms at churches. Jesus was baptized where? In the Jordan River. They did not have, but we do everything in church now. We made our church a point of fellowship. Here's what they did at church. They would come in and they would worship. Yes. They would come in, they would kneel and they would pray. And the ministers would pray and everything was meant to usher in the Holy Spirit and they would pray. And when they would rise up, they would be taught the word of God. And when they finished teaching the word of God, then they would leave. And then they would do the work. They would do the work of ministry outside of the church. But the church was not a place of fellowship. You didn't come to meet your friends at church. You didn't come because they were friendly at church. You didn't come because it has a wonderful praise band. We love the music at church. You came because there was a place where you ushered in the Holy Spirit and where you gave God the praise and glory which he deserves. The Bible says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That means that you don't wait for something to be praiseworthy. You come in knowing that you're praising God for what he's done for you this week and for who God is in your life. You're thinking about how good he is every day and you're coming into the house and you're just giving God glory and lifting him up because he's worthy to be praised. It's not when they hit a good note that you jump up and start praising God because of the, something the praise man did or something that the pastor said made you want to say amen or shout hallelujah. There should be so much shouting going on that the spirit comes down so that I don't even have room to worship and to minister because you have already ushered in the spirit. Yes. See, when everybody comes in, they're thanking God and praising him and giving God glory. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. And sometimes your prayer may be hindered by your praise. That when God is trying to come in, he's trying to enter into your praise. But we won't give God the praise, which gives God an avenue to come in. Give God praise. And God said, I'll inhabit where the praise is. And sometimes I'm praising God in my car, going down the freeway, going down the 101. Just giving God praise. I always get more room when, I'm, when people look and they give me more room when I'm. <laughs> Just get caught up in praising him. Because if you love him and if you praise God. There's no right time to praise him. You just praise him just right there in your cubicle, right there where you are. You just want to give God praise and glory. You don't have to be all dignified. You know, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. You just give God glory because he's a good God. When I grew up in those old churches, those little sanctified churches, they get up there and, and you would see some of the, the mothers that they could barely get to their seats. They barely are making it. But when the music starts, they start thinking about how good God, they start dancing and shouting and jumping and, and giving God glory and that wig and come off and, and they're just jumping around and shouting. I mean, that's praise. When God is in you, like Jeremiah said, it's just like fire that's shut up in my bones. You see, Jeremiah was one that was always praising God and giving God glory and he was doing something that people didn't want to hear. They said, Jeremiah, just shut up. And Jeremiah says, I tried to be still. But it was just like fire. He couldn't be still. You see, when God has been good to you, it's impossible for you to come into the house of God and not want to give God glory and praise. It's impossible for a true believer of God to not want to shout and give God glory that he deserves. I don't know how we can come in and, and, and just be still. When God has done so much, just this week, God is, if you just count your blessings this week, your blessings are, are just over and over what God has done this week. And that deserves something. When God has given you so much, that deserves something. Your, 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 your attitude of gratitude should be just saying thank you. Something should just make you want to give God praise and thanksgiving. You can focus on how bad things are, but you can focus also on how good God is. And I tell you that the good will always outweigh the bad. The good of God will always outweigh the negative things in your life. So if you think about him, how good he is, his soul shouts, hallelujah. You know, if we had our ancestors, if they could come and sit next to you, 
the ones who, who really praised their way through, the ones who climbed up the rough side of the mountains, if they could sit next to you at church, they would turn to you and say, have you lost your mind? <laughs> this is not how hard we have worked and marched, how we have prayed, how we've stood, and how we have fought demons just so that you could have the privilege of being you. Yes. You're standing on somebody else's shoulders. Yes. What you, the privilege that we enjoy, somebody even died for the privilege that we enjoy right now. And we can't even give God glory for it. We're making more money than we've ever made, ever. We're living longer than we've ever lived in history. We're more blessed, but we're giving God less, even though we've got so much more. Just looking at what we've got, just look at your closet sometime. You could even decide what to wear you had so much stuff. So much food that you don't even eat it all. Just, I don't even want it. I, I, I'm just full. And you just push away good food. We were in Mexico a couple of weeks ago. One thing that was interesting was when we would finish the plate, they would grab and say, are you done? It was someone who had, a, had, a play, had, a, had food and they didn't want to eat it because a fly had gotten on, on it. And she says, you, you done with it? And one of the ladies from Mexico grabbed, she says, and she just finished it. And she was humble about it. And we would look at stuff, we just said, we just don't want it. Do you have this in blue? Do you have this in a tin? Do you have this in, can I get this with, with, with this on the side, with that on the side? You see, when you know God, it doesn't, you, you don't have to have preferences. Whatever God brings you is a blessing. Yes. Everything that you've got, you can just give God glory for. Yeah. May not be your size, may not be your color, may not be what you want. But God is all sufficiency. He's everything that you need. And when you can bless God and thank God for little, you'll thank God for much. The early church. The early church was first not denominational. It was not denominational. The way denominations came about in churches was in the Reformation. At one point, the Roman Empire began to spread and conquer territories. And it conquered throughout most all of Europe and Northern Africa. And it conquered in other territories. And it had such power that its reach was all over the world. And with that came the Roman Catholic Church. And everybody that existed in the world was Catholic. If you were in the world, you were Catholic. That's how you were. And if you did not accept the Catholic faith, it was imposed upon you to be Catholic. And there were a few men, John Calvin and Martin Luther and some others, that began to protest against the abuse of power and the indulgences and some of the rituals and the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And they began to write letters and theses to try and reform the Catholic Church, but they were excommunicated. So Martin Luther nailed 95 theses, which is complaints or debates against the Catholic Church. He nailed them on the cathedral, and he began to preach and teach what he felt was the gospel, the way that it should be taught. Martin Luther. And the followers of Martin Luther became known as the what? Lutherans, and that's where the Lutheran church was formed. John Wesley began to teach, and he had a method, that's where the Methodist church was formed. John Calvin is where the Calvinists were formed. And that's where we get all of these denominations, they were all a Protestant move, or the Protestant Reformation. So we have Catholics, and we have all the rest that are called Protestants because we were protesting against the Catholic church. So that's where all these denominations began. But the early church was not a denominational church. It did not have a person's name on it, a Lutheran church, or a Calvinist church. The church has Jesus' name on it. Amen. If you're really going to be a part of a church, be the church that worships Jesus. Amen. We talk about coming to our new members class, and people say, well, why do we have to go to a class? Because you don't know if this is a denominational church or a denomination church. You don't know if this church believes in the Holy Spirit, whether we believe in baptism. You don't know whether we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You don't know anything about our doctrine. So how will you know? Well, I just like Pastor Gene. Pastor Gene has no hell and no heaven. You worship the one God. And if there's any church that you want to be a part of, you need to find out what that church believes. Find out their doctrine, their mission. What is their vision? And that's why we offer that to you as a membership. Well, I want to just join and be a member. Of what? What are you joining? You should know what you're a part of. So the church was not denominational. It was not a 
Catholic Protestant church. It was the church. It was Jesus Christ was the head of every church. The next thing, the new believers were disciples. New believers were disciples. I mean, they were followers of Jesus, not followers of any denomination or any doctrine, followers of Jesus Christ. When you become a disciple, you become a learner. And every church should be a discipleship-making church. You should be able to learn how to use your gifts, the gifts that God has given you, for the edification of the body. And every one of us has a gift. Did you know that? Amen. There's someone sitting next to you that has a gift for you. We have people here that have the gifts of healing right here. The gifts of prophecy is right here. Administration right here in our church. We have pastors who's right here in our church. Teachers who's right here. And you're thinking, not me. Well, of course not you. But the gift in you is given through the Holy Spirit. You see, and as you give control of you to the Holy Spirit, then the gift becomes manifest through the Holy Spirit that you're allowing to be used in you. If you don't allow the, you, the Holy Spirit to have control of you, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to gain authority in you, you'll never use and never realize that you have the gift. When everybody here is using their gifts, what a great, great church. What a great, great world. What a difference that we can make. When everybody starts using your particular gift. But to do that, we've got to surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit's control. And I know that because when I started to in, in, in believing and going to church for myself, and I say for myself because I didn't grow up. Uh, I grew up going to church because I was forced to church. You know, you know how you were forced to church. And we went to church every day, it seemed. I thought we lived in church, and home is a place that we visited. We went to church a lot. But then when I got out of my mother's house, I, I didn't go for a while. But when I came back, I came back because of my own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what everybody needs, a personal relationship. Not a relationship through somebody else. You know somebody that knows somebody. You got to know him for yourself. And when you know him for yourself, that's personal. And that's where you really begin to grow as a child of God in your personal walk with Jesus Christ, not through a denomination. And you do that through what? Discipleship. The work of ministry was done outside the church. When we come here, sometimes the tendency is to want to have fellowship here. This is the church is not the place of fellowship. The church is a place of worship. We come and we praise God here. We lift him up. We give God glory. We exhaust ourselves just praising God and lifting him up. And then we go outside of here. We fellowship in homes. We get together and we fellowship. I think there was a baseball game a few nights ago and all the guys got together and went to the baseball game. We fellowship there. You get together and you fellowship. But the ministry work, the caring was done outside of the church. You know, we only use our lodge on Sunday. It's the only time we use this. But there's still a lot of work that's going on every week by believers. And I'm proud of the work that people are doing here in our church. Even though we do not have a church home, we're doing the work that a church should be able to do. Within the church, they prayed, taught, and they worshiped. And those were, I shared earlier, what they came and did within the church. You taught the word of God. You worshiped. You pray. You praise God within the church. And then the meetings were house to house. That's how they met. My people perished for lack of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And I want to share with you the great commandment as we close. The great commandment. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first one Love. The second like unto it is what? Love. If, you, if we can get the love right. If we can just get the love right. I mean, it covers everything else. If you have enemies, if you can get the love right, your enemies will become your friends. That's one way to get rid of an enemy is to make them a friend. And you can only do that if you get the love right. If we don't have the love right, then we're struggling. And our issue that we're struggling with sometimes is a love issue. Loving those who persecute you, loving those who use you, loving those who talk about you, loving those who have a, you have a difficult time being around. Loving them is the way we get beyond that. And if we have a problem with faith and understanding, then check out dipstick in love. 
We're, we're, we're a few quarts low in love sometimes. We need to have a love refill. Now we can get our love tank full. I tell you, it'll cover a whole bunch of issues that we have in our lives. You can love through your issue. You can love through your hardship. You can love through your abuse. You can love through every issue in your life. If you would just keep loving, why would I say that? Because it says in scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number eight, love never fails. That's a promise. That you would just love, love will never fail. And not, not your kind of love, I'm talking about God's love. Because you say, I, I tried loving him, I tried loving him, I did, I really did, I tried loving him for a day. No, your love will wear out. But the love of Jesus is enduring. The love of Jesus will have you coming back and loving him again. And when you give up one day and the next day you say, I'm not doing it, but something will make you go back and love again. And you just keep loving them and you just keep loving them. And love begins to change. It covers over a multitude of sins and issues in your life. And as you learn how to love it, it's curing, it's healing, not just to them, but it's healing also for us. Amen. Love covers unforgiveness. The hurts that someone has done in you, to you in the past, love will cover all of those issues that you had in your past. If you could just love them enough. Real quickly, Acts 2, 42 and 47. Love God with all of your heart. That is worship. If you love him with all of your heart, that's why we worship him. When you come into the house and your idea is you just love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. You love your neighbors yourself. That's ministry. When you love someone, you will do for them. If you love your children, you'll do for them. <clears throat> Even when your children mess up, you... Love them. You may not like them sometimes, but you love them. Even when people do wrong to you, you love them. That's ministry. It's looking beyond their fault and seeing their need. Some people just need someone to love them. They're being the way they are because someone just haven't loved them through it. And if you can love them through the issue in their life, I promise you, you've gained a, a new believer for Jesus because they've seen him in you. Continue to love them. Go and make disciples is evangelism. Going and making disciples is a difficult task. You have to know that you do not go alone. That when you go out, the Holy Spirit goes with you. And the path is set before you. And the people are prepared to receive Jesus Christ. There are people who's waiting for an evangelist to come and share the word of Jesus Christ with them. That makes all the difference. And baptizing them as fellowship. There's some people right now, we, we need to do a baptism real soon. I heard a few people who want to be baptized, and we need to make that happen. But baptism is one way to make your full commitment to Jesus Christ when you're baptized. Teaching them to do is discipleship. Everyone here who knows Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, should have a learning track that you're on. Some way that you really are learning and growing. Do you know the 10 disciples? I mean, the 10 commandments, the 12 disciples. Do you know the Great Commission, the fruit of the Spirit, the armor of God? Those are simple things that we should know. And there should be certain scriptures that you should know. What does Jesus say regarding certain things that's going on in your life? How does faith come? Does the Bible tell us to love one another? See, that's how you have to learn. You grow as a disciple. And when you're growing, those things come to you at your point of need. And every church exists so that we're maturing the believers. So that you're no longer a baby Christian. You can't be a baby Christian forever. There's a point to where you become a, a mature Christian, where you're now leading others to Jesus. You're using your spiritual gift. You're learning that it's you. And if you look at someone else, that that person was you until somebody came to you and shared with you the good news of the gospel. That's how you came to know Christ. And now we're to go back and get somebody else. There was a man who had a dog, and the dog was sick. And the dog was lying there on the porch, and hasn't, hadn't moved. But a friend visited him, the friend was a veterinarian. The friend went over and examined the dog, looked at him, and he went to his car and he got something and he gave it to the dog. And within a half hour, the dog was up and moving around. 
the dog was feeling good. And the next time that the man visited his friend, the dog saw him and the dog took off. And then a moment or so later, he came clutching another dog in his teeth, bringing him to the man. He said, if you could do that for me, maybe you could help my friend. And that's what we are. When Jesus Christ has been instrumental in your life, and you see somebody suffering, you go and you grab them, say, you go to church with me. Don't invite them to church. Go and get them. I'm, I'm, so what are you doing Sunday morning? Okay, I'm going to drop by. And you just grab them. Bring them to church. Amen. And when you bring them in here, they'll be so glad that you took the time to go and get them to bring them to Jesus. We invite people. Say, oh, you should come to my church. Oh, yeah, it's somewhere over Thomas somewhere. But when you go and you spend the time to go and take them and bring them to him, what a difference you're making. That's what the church does. Renew your commitment. What is your focus? Are you on track? Is your priorities in order? If not, list them. Who are you spending your time? Let's make Jesus Christ the main thing. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you.